Joe Rogan experience number 1178, Dr. Rhonda Patrick. This is actually the eighth time Dr. Rhonda Patrick has been on the JRE. I looked this up because I remember listening to a podcast and actually learning things, and I was like, that must have been a long time ago. Because now I feel like I'm batting in the major leagues compared to these people. But she was on back in like the beginning of 2014, which was around when I was only a year into this diet. So I still had a lot of things to learn compared to what I know now. But overall, the problem is Dr. Rhonda Patrick isn't really well versed on the carnivore diet, especially, you know, I mean, even people on the carnivore diet aren't well versed on the nutrient density of certain animal foods. And that pertained to a lot of questions she was asked and couldn't really answer professionally on, at least from my experience. And then she just talked about the importance of vegetables a lot. But the problem I have with that is the vegetables we have now are modified forms of like one family of cruciferous vegetables. And, you know, they're not the wild plants and wild vegetables we used to buy. It's one thing if they were saying, oh, go to local farmers markets, buy, you know, heirloom grains, buy local fruits, local vegetables, incorporate those into your diet. It's one thing to say that as opposed to say shove broccoli sprouts down your throat, which is pretty much what they said. <laughs> And the most contradictory thing was she's kind of against the diet this whole time. And then she starts talking about the benefits of salmon roe and DHA. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like Mr. Salmon Row. I've been advocating salmon roe for two, like two, three years now, at least on YouTube. And I've been eating salmon roe myself for much longer than that. I've been, I was taking spoonfuls of cod liver oil five, six years ago when I started this diet. Well, let's actually go down the podcast itself and just talk on the points just to give you guys a summary of the podcast for the most part. We're not going to, I mean, there were like, I might say like, you know, brought up how her baby likes plastic, a bottle talks about the dangers of BPA, uh, how the water sits in plastic and heat uh, talk about air pollution and brake fumes. But this was literally like 20 minutes of those four points I just said. And what we're going to really focus on and talk about are the carnivore diet points. So there's probably about Half of this podcast, we're not really going to talk about. We're just going to mention the brief points they were talking about for 10, 20 minutes at times. Uh, so the first part of the carnivore diet was Rhonda Patcher saying, that's crazy, no way. That was her response when she first found out about this diet. But, you know, she was like, oh, that's crazy to eat that much meat. But Joe Rogan probably gets most of his calories from animal foods, even if by volume he eats a lot of vegetables. And all indigenous groups got 65 to 75 percent of their calories from animal foods and the remainder from wild plant foods or in some cases in after the neolithic rye bread oats various grains but there are some groups of indigenous people that got almost 80 to 90 percent of their calories from animal foods so it's not unrealistic as she's making it sound with the context of those peoples then she said there's no published evidence i was like what do you mean there's no published evidence? There's no published evidence on the paleo diet, which is what she follows. There's no published evidence on a lot of things. So you're just going to dismiss it? You know, there's no real published evidence on keto or various other diets that you speak about are beneficial, you know, to the same degree that there's very few things done on the carnivore diet. Well, people can, I mean, my dad eats a loaf of bread a day, and I'm sure people have been doing that for many years, but there's no studies on that. What is, like, I'm not, all right, I'm just, I'm getting silly now. Her two theories to why the diet works was because people eat less on a higher protein diet and that people eat the same food, they tend to eat less of it. The first part, eating less on a higher protein diet, is true because most people are lacking nutrition and high protein foods have more nutrition in them. And we're talking vitamins and minerals as well as just protein and fat. And people eating the same food, they eat less. That ties in with, and Rhonda Patrick, of all people, you should know that fat, protein, and carbohydrate have different satiation levels. If you eat only butter, and then you're, not, you know, you're only going to eat like a 1,000 calories worth of butter at most, and then if you move on to steak, then you can move on to honey or ice cream, different foods have different palatabilities. I think I have to redo my video on food palatability because it's something people don't understand. The importance of eating fat or liver first, like the organs and the fat and the satiating foods first, and then moving on to the lean protein, moving on to sweets, because your body has different satiation levels for different foods. Uh, but for her not to know that and to know why that's the reason when people only eat one type of food they eat less, to me, screams not too experienced. Try to compare microbiome changes in fasting to the carnivore diet, but the only common thing between fasting and the carnivore diet is they can both rem remove inflammation from the digestive system. And then she said minocycline, which is uh, it was an antibiotic used that altered gut bacteria that wiped out the bad gut bacteria as well as the good eventually, people saw benefits short term. 
So she was trying to say, oh, people are, are going to only see benefits in the carnivore diet short term. But the carnivore diet, your gut microbiome adapts to meat. It's a permanent thing. It's not a temporary fix. And it's not like those gut bacteria are inherently bad. They're just different. And then she said, putrefication is linked to colon cancer. But putrefication is just how foods digest in the human digestive system. We have a putreficative digestive system, whereas herbivorous animals have a fermentation. I mean, this just she's just using words that sound bad. Then she started bringing up putrescine and cadaverine, which are uh, breakdowns of amino acids. Every Rhonda Patrick has putrescine and cadaverine. Joe Rogan has plenty of putrescine and cadaverine. They're just framing it as something bad. This is almost like. Um, almost like propaganda. They're just saying things that sound bad to scare people, like fear-mongering. These are normal, uh, what's it called? Um, these are normal products of amino acid digestion. And they're kind of saying they're bad because of how they sound. And it's probably working to some people, unfortunately. Uh, it has nothing to do with, you know, I mean, it's probably higher in carnivorous people because they eat more meat, but it's just a process of human metabolism, human digestion. And, uh, you know, Inuits, Eskimos, all these indigenous groups eating these foods in large amounts, you know, it's just missing that, that anecdote and that analogy just seems silly. And then if we want to bring up uh, the lifespan, we'll bring up the lifespan of those people in a minute. But, uh, you know, she really did emphasize that this diet might only be good for a one to two year window. And then they started talking about Sean Baker. But guys, Sean Baker is an a uh, very high level athlete. He follows a not good version of the carnivore diet, so to speak. And using him as an example from this diet, even Michaela Peterson aren't necessarily the best examples. Starts comparing fasting, removal of inflammation, went over that. She said the diet was risky, potentially dangerous, and unstudied. But you have people literally eating poison, sugar, vegetable oils, refined processed foods, fast food. Saying meat, a meat only meat diet is worse than the standard American diet, to me, seems crazy. It's just unbelievable. Setting themselves up for long-term damage. And going back to there's no data. Are the perfect skulls of indigenous Eskimos and Native Americans not data? You know, are, are, is looking at certain groups of people and seeing their skeletal structure and how physically developed they were compared to us and their larger brain size, is that not data? Come on. You know, 17th century English had a life expectancy of 35 years old. Hunter-gatherers, if they lived to 40, tended to live into their 70s, but hunter-gatherers did not die from degenerative diseases. Hunter-gatherers got their skull cracked open by Grok, unfortunately. Uh, then they brought up Michaela Peterson giving nutrition counseling, and yeah, I kind of agree she shouldn't because she had diarrhea for six weeks and didn't know that the only reason you would be having diarrhea for that long of a period of time is that you're allergic to the food. It's not a good source of food. Maybe it's tainted with cross-contamination. You're overcooking the food. Sometimes rendered fat does not digest too well, or the fat is too high in omega-6 fatty acids, or it could even be a histamine intolerance. Uh, you should never have diarrhea for more than a day or two on this diet if you eat a food. Uh, her not knowing that just shows a lack of nutritional knowledge in general. Uh, you know, Her sticking with diarrhea for six weeks without trying to say, maybe I should try a different food, maybe I should cook it differently is just, to me... She should not be giving anyone nutritional advice. That's a that's a bit of an understatement. And then, then Rhonda Patrick brought up that she follows modified paleo. And I was like, oh, my God, this woman is such a hypocrite. You know, she's saying that there's no data on the carnivore diet, but she follows modified paleo, which is like the most criticized diet for not having data to back it up. Uh, and then they started talking about fish oil, how it gives a dopamine response in the body and how she takes three to six grams per day. And that when they do studies on fish oil, uh, they usually only do one gram, but three to six grams of fish oil, guys, is like a few hundred calories worth of mackerel. It's not actually a crazy amount, but then Joe Rogan asked, is there a USDA recommendation for fish oil? And she said, oh, no, there isn't because you can convert uh, ALA into omega-3s, but Rhonda Patrick was kind of, you know, she was saying, oh, you could convert it to EPA and DHA. She literally said, you can convert ALA to EPA and DHA, but... It's been shown that in men, you cannot raise blood levels of DHA with an ALA supplement. And the conversion rate is minuscule. You'd have to literally drink like a cup of flax oil every day, which is completely crazy. Her not knowing this and then talking about the importance of fish oil and stuff to me is just so contradictory. And then what's even funnier is 
She says the USDA doesn't recommend fish oil, but yet she's taking all this fish oil. And then when we start talking about vitamin C and vitamin E, she's like, oh, the USDA recommendations are important. Am I losing, am I losing brain cells right now? I think that's this feeling I have in my brain. Jesus. <laughs> start talking about micronutrients, the RDAs, uh, 30 essential vitamins and minerals to various metabolic functions. Uh, the pro main problem I have with the RDAs is D3 is too low. Calcium is too high. Magnesium is a bit unrealistic. It's, you know, just a lot of the RDAs are pretty incorrect. The, she said this diet, uh, oh no, the RDAs are set for deficiencies, not for optimal health. She said that people think their glucose levels are so low on the carnivore diet, they don't need vitamin C, but uh, that, that is a part of glucose metabolism requiring vitamin C, but all animal tissue has vitamin C. You know, they kind of made a point that, oh, if you eat certain organs, you'll get vitamin C, but all animal tissue has it, especially if you're eating three to four pounds of meat a day. And uh, if you guys haven't read The Fat of the Land, Volyamory Stephenson, I'm going to do a video on scurvy in a couple days. Definitely check it out. Any fresh food has anti-scorbutic properties. The importance of preventing scurvy is more about eating fresh food that's not overcooked as opposed to eating vegetables and fruits. Uh, scurvy is caused by preserved foods, and it sets in with about three weeks. Uh, I remember on one expedition in that book, they got scurvy because they disobeyed orders and only ate preserved foods. And the scurvy was cured on four days of a raw meat and cooked meat diet. Literally cured in four days completely. Uh, they started talking about how spleen, liver, I don't. Th I think they mentioned spleen had vitamin C, but liver also has vitamin C. This girl eats salmon roe every day and she doesn't know it has vitamin C and vitamin E. Like, are you serious? Uh, maybe I'm just... Maybe I'm just too smart. Who knows? Maybe I'm the only person on the planet who knows that salmon roe has vitamin E and vitamin C. Maybe I'm the only person that ever looked at a non-USDA nutritional database for vitamins. I'm getting tilted, man. Yeah, I mean, all tissues in the animal for the most part, if it's a pastured animal, will have some vitamin C and vitamin E. Uh, you know, the, the various indigenous groups eating these only meat diets, not getting scurvy, uh, but they did eat both raw and cooked. They did eat various head tissues, organs, and more things like that, not just grain-fed muscle meat. Now, if you ate only grain-fed, well-done muscle meat salted, I think you might actually be able to get scurvy. Like if it was really overcooked, like if you ate barbecue every day and that was it, like slow-cooked barbecue, I think you might actually get scurvy. Uh, vitamin E is another thing she brought up as a very potent antioxidant, but same thing with vitamin C. It's, it's in those animal foods, they just don't know about them. And then she brought up, I believe, folate and said she, you have to eat like 150 grams of beef liver per day for folate. And then she was like, who does that? I do. <laughs> no, I'm joking, guys. Folate is, I, I do eat that much liver, but I'm, I'm just joking in a sense that you don't have to do that. Uh, because every animal food pretty much has some amount of folate. If you eat like a pound of beef, you get like, I think, 20 to 30% of your folate. And if most people eat two to three pounds a day and... Pastured foods have more of all of these vitamins. Uh, you know, kidney has folate, beef liver, salmon roe. All organ tissues in the animal are much higher in folate than the muscle. Uh, she mentioned, like, you're damaging your DNA. Uh, you have to eat liver every day to prevent that. This is just so crazy. Oh, and then hour and three minutes in, he mentioned, I follow a young man who advocates eating organ meats. Uh, what can you say against that? And then she said, oh, well, you might not get enough magnesium. She kind of started around it, too. She was like, her only rebuttal for someone that ate plenty of organ meats was you're not getting enough magnesium and that it's not practical to eat that many organ meats. But magnesium is if you ate two to three pounds, four pounds of meat a day with organs, you're getting, I believe, a few hundred milligrams of magnesium. So you're going to get more than almost anyone a standard American diet gets. So I don't know why you would criticize magnesium because no one gets no one gets their magnesium RDA on this diet. And people that think they're getting that their magnesium RDA are getting it from nuts and seeds that actually have phytic acid. So they're not getting as much magnesium as they think there are. It's by, bound to oxalates and phytic acid. You think eating a handful of Brazil nuts is giving you uh, magnesium. It's not. Uh, they briefly touched on supplementing, but guys, supplementing does get tricky. Uh, check out my electrolytes video to see how complicated supplementing gets with all the chelated minerals, glyconate, malate, citrate, um, citrate, malate, uh, phosphate. There's just so many different chelated minerals, and each of them respond in the body differently. 
I don't want to give anyone ideas, but like potassium citrate is the amount, the one that occurs in food naturally. There's a magnesium glycinate. There's just too many. Supplementing gets too complicated. I prefer to use natural foods like seaweed. Uh, they brought up the putrefactive bacteria and saying that, uh, you know, it's it's bad for the digestive system, but it's just so crazy. They're just using words that sound bad that are normal processes of human metabolism. Uh, she started saying that humans ate these vegetables for phytochemicals, polyphenols, isoflavones for thousands and thousands of years. But we didn't eat these modern cruciferous vegetables that you're telling people to shove down their throats. Like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. You're saying we ate, you're pretty much saying we ate wild plant foods for thousands of years, but eat broccoli, which is a man-made vegetable. Uh, and the other constant that we ate for thousands and thousands of years is these animal foods. So why wouldn't you bring that up too? Uh, they started talking about studies about the benefits of sulforaphane, but it's like studies like, oh, if you eat X amount of broccoli sprouts per day, your chance of prostate cancer lowers 5%. Like, come come on, you know. Uh, they talked about uh, how it treats autism symptoms, and I'm like, well, I don't see cave paintings of children with autism. I don't see any signs of autism in, uh, you know, indigenous people didn't even know. There are some indigenous people that didn't know what insomnia was. They literally never had problems sleeping ever in their cultural history. You know, the humans in their primitive state are absent of these problems. I mean, a good example, like your cats and your dogs will sleep all day, you know. and I mean, that's, that's probably not a good example. So let's move on to something else. Uh, they start talking about E. coli, and, and they didn't, what bothered me was they didn't know anything about E. coli. You know, Dr. Rana Patrick does all this nutrition research and doesn't know anything about E. coli or where it's from. And E. coli is in, is in all digestive systems of animals. Uh, what makes E. coli harmful is uh, cattle that are fed grains have higher acidity in the stomach and the E. coli becomes acid resistant. What that does is, uh, you know, when humans get that strain of E. coli, it makes them sick. Uh, and it's in manure and that's how it gets on the veg. Just because if, that's very simple to explain. And, that Joe or Rhonda did not know that to me is a concern. And they, uh, I mean, to me, this just seems staged that they don't know. They have to Google stuff like that off the top of their head. And then she said sulforaphane is so beneficial. Read the studies, guys. Read the studies on sulforaphane. But she talked negatively about heterocyclic amines, which are formed when you cook meat. I was like, there is specifically a study on heterocyclic amines that says there is insufficient scientific evidence that these genotoxic compounds cause cancer in humans, which to me showed she's telling you, oh, read the studies on my stuff, but she hasn't read the studies on the stuff she's talking negatively about. Um, Joe Rogan started talking about how he eats more vegetables than meat, but calorically speaking, he probably eats way more meat than vegetables, just from the percentage of calories uh, he's getting from meat. Uh, then they dismissed the anecdotes of the carnivore diet, but then they brought up anecdotes of elimination diets, fasting, keto. So they, they're just choosing which anecdotes are good and which anecdotes aren't, which is and that's very hypocritical. Uh, they said there were positive benefits like hormesis when stressing your body in certain ways with plant foods, but the only benefit for that might be to adapt to future stressors. But again, guys, the point is they're referring to plant foods that are man-made, all cruciferous, which is not what we would have eaten in the wild. That's To me, that's the whole thing I can't really get past in this argument. You're saying all the benefits of plant foods, blah, 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 but you keep talking about cruciferous vegetables. You know, you're know, you not talking about roots. You're not talking about other... There's thousands and thousands of probably other vegetables you could be talking about and eating and fruits, but you're just hammering home cruciferous vegetables, which doesn't make sense to me. It really doesn't make sense. You know... You're not talking about, you know, you know, there's six, like at least six different types of wheat, right? There's einkorn wheat, which digests much easier on the stomach. There's spelt, there's emmer wheat, there's Coruscant wheat. There's different types of winter wheats, hard red winter wheat, spring wheat. There's different types of rye. There's different types of barleys, uh, farro. There's literally dozens of probably heirloom grains that when properly prepared would be safe to consume. But you guys didn't know that. Maybe you should have me on the podcast and ask me instead of just mentioning me without saying my name. They brought up the Michaela Peterson had diarrhea for six weeks. And I said that earlier. She has no clue what she's doing. Uh, prolonged fast more than 48 hours is what's considered a prolonged fast. I fasted for up to two weeks, guys. I have to do a video on fasting. Uh, they talk about a fasting mimicking diet for a little bit. And at this point, this was kind of where uh, carnivore went out the window. 
But they did start talking about DHA, and the, and that's why Rhonda Patrick takes a lot of fish oil, which I think is a problem because of the questionable rancidity of fish oil. And uh, she eats a lot of salmon roe every day for her DHA. So for me, to her to talk about all these foods and then say, I take a crazy amount of DHA because of how beneficial it is, I'm like... You're literally consuming a high-fat, soluble vitamin diet from animal foods, but you're speaking against it almost. So, I don't know. I really don't. And then, and then what bothered me was just the lack of general knowledge. You know, she eats salmon roe every day, but doesn't know Ikura is salmon eggs. I know. I work in a restaurant. I know that stuff. But to me, that was just a little silly. And I've advocated salmon roe for years, guys. For years, guys. I'm Mr. Salmon Row. I've been talking about salmon roe since like uh, 2015. I always recommended it to people when I started this diet. And taking it for a while myself. Uh, you know, they hypothesize that a uh, small percentage of the population is allergic to a lot of plants. But guys, people are allergic to a lot of things. They just ignore low-level inflammatory reactions, you know. People go their whole lives farting terrible and having digestive issues. And they don't understand that you could have different degrees of allergies to foods. Drinking raw dairy might give me insomnia for four days when... Eating onions might make me fart, but those are both technically allergies. And even if brain fog from eating wheat is considered an, not considered an allergy, you know, you can, people can tolerate. Humans are very resilient. They just suffer from things that they're so used to that they don't consider that those are allergy symptoms. Then they suggested using fasting to fix the gut as opposed to a carnivore diet as a Band-Aid. But a carnivore diet isn't a Band-Aid. It's more of a permanent cast because it removes all inflammation and increases nutrient density if done properly. Uh, then they spoke about the ketones effect on the brain for a while. And then they talked about saunas for like 40 minutes. So a very typical Rhonda Patrick podcast. But uh, this is already way longer than I wanted it to be, guys. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Um, I got this. I got a dynamic microphone because it picks up too much. The compressor mics, the condenser mics, uh, they pick up too much background noise. They could literally pick up like my computer fan. It's ridiculous. Uh, no, I mean, you know, this has been kind of, I had to, I did this response because like he literally mentioned me on the last two carnival related podcasts without saying my name, which kind of pissed me off to no end uh, to be truthful. But what are you going to do? Uh, so thank you guys for watching. If you guys would like to support me, I feel like a broken record. Just share the video. <laughs> uh, I do a new thing on Patreon where it, I will do questions answered for certain amounts of money, full diet write-ups, partial diet write-ups, and one-on-one -on -one consultations. Uh, depending on various degrees of Patreon support, guys, you can check that out. Uh, the Patreon link's in the description. If you guys would like to reach out to me for one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, related to diet, uh, fitness, uh, <laughs> cooking, uh, whatever it may be, guys, if you want to just ask me questions about myself, uh, just shoot me an email, Frank A. Tufano at gmail.com. Hey, maybe you want to ask me, Frank, how do you get your teeth so white? Frank, how do you do your eyebrows? How do you put on your makeup? Things like that. How do you get this ridiculous looking afro hair? Uh, 